morning and good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Uh, welcome to the 8th South South Forum on Sustainability. And uh, we are having this very exciting session uh, on the politics of love and hope. And um, uh, let me introduce myself. I have taught in the Lingnan University for 35 years, uh, first in translation and then in cultural studies. I'm currently coordinator of the program on cultures of sustainability in the Center for Cultural Research and Development. And I'm also director of the executive team of the Global University for Sustainability. I've been involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China for over two decades, and I'm also a board member of Peace Women across the globe. So today we are very, very honored to have with us uh, three very eminent uh, scholars. And uh, I would like to first introduce our two co-moderators uh, co for tonight, for today. So Professor Wang Hui is a leading contemporary Chinese scholar Professor of the Departments of Chinese and History at Tsinghua University and Director of the Tsinghua Institute for Advanced Study in Humanities and Social Sciences. He is the author of Resisting Despair, a study of Lu Xun and his literary world, and also The Rise of Modern Chinese Thought in four big volumes, among others. Uh, Professor Akbar Abbas is, has been had taught at the University of Hong Kong for almost 40 years, and he was my teacher when I studied in the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he was the chair of Comparative Literature Department and co-director of the Center for the Study of Globalization and Cultures. Currently, he is professor of Comparative Literature at the University of California, Irving. His best known work is Hong Kong, Culture and the Politics of Disappearance. Recently, he has been returning more frequently to Hong Kong to give lectures and seminars, particularly at the Linan University and also at other institutions. His research interests include globalization, Hong Kong and Chinese culture, architecture, cinema, post-colonialism and critical theory. Now, I would like to hand over to uh, Professor Wang Hui to introduce uh, Professor Paul Bobe. Please. It's my great honor and a great pleasure uh, to moderate together with Professor Akaba Abbas uh, for the lecture by the, uh, Professor Paul Bobe. Uh, let me introduce briefly about uh, uh, Paul. Paul Bobe is a distinguished professor um, of English at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. He holds affiliations with the Institute for Culture Studies at the University of Valencia in Spain and the Center for International Political Studies in Pretoria, South Africa. From 1994 to 1999, he served on the board of directors of the Institute of Postmodern Studies at Peking University. And also I know that he was the visiting professor at Hong Kong University too. He is the author of Love Shadow, Poetry Against the Torture, uh, Mastering Discourse, Intellectuals in Power, culture in Bush era and others. He is the editor of Boundary 2. This is a very important, uh, for me, it's not only the ac academic journal, but also the intellectual journal. He uh, and uh, deeply engaged in the contemporary issues. And uh, of course, with some focus on postmodern, very famous for its postmodern theory, literature and the culture. He's also editor of the Boundary 2 Review, which published extended online magazines on digital, culture, gender, sexuality, and literature and politics. He also edits the Journal of YouTube channel for video lectures and interviews. Uh, today, he will talk about the, uh, uh, the deep adaptation and the ambiguous value of hope. I think he will bring us with some different perspective and visions on the issue of the sustainability and so on and so forth. So welcome, Paul. Thank you, Wang Wei, very much for such a kind and generous uh, introduction. Um, 
I'm very, very happy to be here. And um, can everyone hear me now, by the way? Yes. I'm going to talk on the topic of deep adaptation theory and the ambiguous value of hope. My uh, topics, my subtopics for discussion are sustainability, imagination, and experience. I am very grateful to the South-South Forum on Sustainability for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, I especially thank Kinchi Lau for her generosity and welcome, which she has achieved remarkably over quite a long distance. I accepted the offer to speak with you today because like most humans with a responsible sense of their lives in the world, I care deeply about the policy, ethical and intellectual crises caused by climate change. For some time, issues of human survival and the species responsibility to the planet, the host of our being, has shadowed my writing and research. In Love's Shadow, which Wang Wei mentioned a moment ago and which Harvard University Press published in January of 2021, I wrote, and now I just quote myself for a second, I wrote that secularized humanity possesses the resources to sustain life, humanity, and its responsibility to creation. When I think now and when I thought then about the human species responsibility to the planet, I also think about time and the ways in which humans order their sense of time and how they live in time. These last two do not necessarily reconcile with each other. In Love Shadow, I made these points early on to make clear how essential they are to my writing and thinking. In that book, I presented key features of human imagination and creativity in general, and its effective presence in poets and artists. I objected then, and I will again today, to utopian thinking. Now, when the fact and risk of extermination press upon the ecosystem and upon human history. I said in that book that human, and now again I quote myself, that human experience is too complex for utopian thinking because like all forms of prophetic thinking, utopian notions offer what I call promissory visions as displacements into future temporalities that cannot deliver any future and that numb the human responsibility for futurity. My research showed that utopian thinking depends upon and postulates societies, civilizations, and worlds in ruin to keep its own authority. I've proven, I think, that utopianism embraced as an ideology, a rationalized set of desires and interests mask, masked as beliefs, hinders both human action and understanding. In this talk, I will make some use of what has come to be called deep adaptation theory. I do so because deep adaptation theory, which is a strong critique of those invested in sustainability and the discourse of sustainability, also allows me to return in a new and I think deeper way to the problem of hope. As a critique, which I know is an unfashionable phenomenon in many sections of the literary academy at least. But as critique, deep adaptation theory has cognitive as well as cognitive and practical implications. Deep adaptation theory, and here now I quote Bendel, quote, questions the basis for all the work in the field of sustainability. What does sustainability mean in the context of deep adaptations critique? It refers to an institutionalized as well as common sense, scientific, political, corporate, and public set of views that create a consensus. It consists of what deep adaptation theory calls, and here I quote, the existing research, policy, and practice on climate adaptation as framed by the view that we can manage the impacts of a changing climate on our physical, economic, social, 
political and psychological situations, end of quote. Deep adaptation theory belongs to thinking across society now that rightly questions bureaucratically and institutionally established frameworks for research and belief. At its weakest, deep adaptation theory reworks sustainability research and ways of thinking. In this case, in its weakest case, the theory, theory merely revises sustainability talk and asks that we make our efforts more expansive that, and I quote again, that we consider how communities, countries, and humanity can adapt to the coming troubles, end quote, rather than managing them by policy, technology, or localist commitments. <clears throat> the major point of connection between sustainability studies and deep adaptation theory hinges on the concept and emotion of hope. The belief that we can manage climate change to cope with its inevitable consequences rests upon assumptions about technology, the control of nature, and role of the state in directing economic practices that exhaust the planet, that is practices that exhaust the planet, as well as other notions often unstated but necessary to the work of sustainability planners and theorists. Management practice assesses climate change in terms of disruption to supply lines, demographics, food production, and so on. It is a future-oriented practice resting on the belief that an inescapable crisis has not yet arrived, not yet been set in motion, or might still be delayed or deferred. Walter Benjamin, the great German philosopher and critic, studied modern technology in the early 20th century to analyze how it and the belief and investment therein embodies not only a relation between the human and the natural, but, the, but nature and the form of relations among people. I would add to Benjamin's formulation the quality revealed by forms of technology, that is how the human subject organizes its own relation to culture, to sets of belief and to forms of time in ways that are deeply pr pragmatic and thoroughly internalized. I'm thinking here now of uh, French philosopher Georges Canguillem, who adapted Darwinian notions of evolution to theorize the effectiveness of concept and concept making to the survival of the, of the species in society. Deep adaptation theory notes not only the dangers of unknowns inherent in projects to re-engineer the ecosystem to remove carbon from the atmosphere, but also the assumption of smooth or continuous time underlying such projects. Carbon capture, for example, believes the present state can be kept by a vicious circle of consuming energy to capture carbon made atmospheric by the production of energy. More ambitiously, plans to remove accumulated carbon from the atmosphere would protect against catastrophe by reversing the historical effects of the carbon era, even to return to a status quo ante to a state of nature and society without the threat posed by the massive accumulations of displaced carbon in the ecosystem. In these models, deep adaptation theory detects arrogance of a familiar kind common among technophilic thinkers, investors, and state policymakers. Moreover, deep adaptation theory notes that this engineering model assumes that the catastrophe of human extinction caused by climate change has not yet begun. As Bendel's studies conducted in the UK, as Bendel's studies show, there is every reason to believe the planet has already reached the so-called tipping point where climate change is self-reinforcing, irreversible, and accelerating in a non-linear fashion. While this might not be true in the sense that uncertainty inheres in the data and the science. The likelihood that this is true, again, depending on the same data and science about the oceans, melting ice, deforestation, and climate change, must be the starting point for thinking. Technophilic efforts to overcome the catastrophe of human extinction and the extinction of thousands of other species rests on a familiar and discredited cultural paradigm developed during the 19th century in Europe 
when in the West, industrial technology affected ordinary life and disrupted the relations between persons and, natures and nature. Conservative anti-capitalists regretted the loss of an organic world, a set of relations among humans and between the species and natural world unmediated by carbon culture. These conservative thinkers were organicists in modern critical study of their desire and intent. In the West, we find these sentiments and figures as different as Wordsworth in England, Hawthorne and Emerson in America, Martin Heidegger in Germany, and political movements with utopian visions. I live in Western Pennsylvania, not far from the city of Pittsburgh, which of course is famous for its history of coal production and steel production. In fact, my home is very near what is called the Pittsburgh coal seam, often described as the world's largest deposit of carbon energy. Not only was oil first developed and exploited here, but it is the largest coal deposit in the world. And it now is the home to the largest, second largest fracking industry in the United States. So in Western Pennsylvania though, where I live, the landscape is also dotted with the traces of escapist settlements run by small groups of often religious believers. One such place, now like most such places, a tourist spot is called Old Economy Village, Old Economy Village. Founded by an offshoot of the Lutheran Church migrated from Germany to America, the movement's name reveals a great deal about its purpose. It called itself the Harmony Society, and it incorporated itself as a commune or communist society that returned to subsistence agriculture and small artisanal manufacturing. Of course, modernity also supplied models of utopian technophilia in, for example, Weimar inspired thinking about urban planning and architecture. The relation between these models and actual capitalist practice came under popular cinematic critique in Charlie Chaplin's 1936 film, Modern Times. Deep adaptation theory understands technophilic efforts to change climate to control or reverse the effects of carbon culture as a form of such organicist utopianism and calls this high level plan effort or fantasy by the name restoration. What is restoration? I quote again, it involves people and communities rediscovering attitudes and approaches to life and organization that our hydrocarbon fueled civilization eroded, end quote. What might this entail? Actions and values similar in kind to the harmonists of the 19th century, quote again, rewilding landscapes so they provide more ecological benefits and require less management, changing diets back to match the seasons, rediscovering non-electronically powered forms of play and increased community level productivity and support." End of quote. We should remember, of course, that the harmonists and others of their kind did not survive and that the communities they fantasized did not function. Their values, their sense of time, their belief in reversibility and escape, these were all unpragmatic and dysfunctional values and beliefs. The higher level technophilic ambitions to reverse climate damage by the application of machines and energy combined the arrogance of human belief in the beneficent control of nature, neglecting the astonishing complexity of feedback loops with the restorative fantasy of organicist vision. Deep adaptation theory like strong theoretical developments in related humanistic fields has a not fully worked out, a not fully worked out critique of capitalism, as well as a surface analysis of cultural failure to prepare humans and so societies to address what it calls, quote, a threat to well being and indeed even existence, end of quote. Around the economic crisis of 2008, intellectuals particularly celebrated alert, particular, popularly, sorry, let me begin that paragraph again. 
Around the economic crisis of 2008, intellectuals popularly celebrated alerts to such well-known phenomena as the butterfly effect and the black swan. Nassim Nicholas Taleb drew attention to the impossibility of completely successful foresight. I quote Taleb, consider that many black swan events, such as the crisis of 2008, can be caused and exacerbated by their being unexpected. Taleb stressed the well-known problem in all strategic planning, quote, what you know can be truly inconsequential, end quote. The challenge deep adaptation theory sets against technophilic beliefs in managing or even overcoming climate catastrophe to pretend, pre, uh, prevent human extinction is a challenge to the very model of thought that frames such ambitions. One element in that model is knowledge and reasonable or probabilistic confidence in the knowledge, its application and its effects. Taleb's book, Black Swan, a book aimed at the rational choice model of economics, figures the dangers inherent in the arrogance of knowledge, of the faith in knowability as an actional value or possibility. And he figures this all in the metaphor of a library. Invoking the great Italian novelist and semiotician Umberto Eco to make his point, and echoing the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges as well, Taleb proposes that library shelves should groan under the weight of books on subjects we do not know. I think this is an extremely interesting idea, rich in implication. I will try to draw out these implications and the rest of what I say and bring it back to the question of hope. First and most obviously, this figure of the library indicts the academic or professional specialist whose shelves, or as we better would say now, whose computer folders have all that is defined as relevant within a specific field or subfield aimed at a particular research problem or topic of personal investigation. Secondly, and by implication, the image indicts professional formation. Black Swans is an anti-professional book, including those uh, formations devoted to sustainability for the specialized foci of study and for the exclusion from the field of unknown materials defined as wasteful or irrelevant. Thirdly, as Taleb following Echo makes clear, knowledge is a form of property, often personal, but just as often institutional or disciplinary. CVs, curriculum vitae, records of one's own achievement. These announce qualifications and achievements as forms of personal, career, institutional, and social capital value. Deep adaptation theory has a powerful critique of the professional classes doing research into climate change, social and economic disruption, and the technical adaptation to the change, including efforts at their control or amelioration. Bendel describes the investment of persons and institutions in sustainability studies and projects as the entanglement of fears, social failures, reward systems, and false beliefs. The structure of reinforcement, this structure of reinforcement, obstructs thinking about the outside of what is officially known by these persons, associations, practices, and corporate structures. In effect, this complex, this professional disciplinary complex holds a bias toward the status quo and as such makes it impossible to think the situation of the species and planet now. Bendel often notes that institutionally approved and politically certified statements are far more benign and less frightening than the work of isolated, even if well-respected climate forecasters. Also, he gives solid documentary evidence of censorship among those organized in the offices of sustainability who insist that the truth of extermination should not be spoken for fear of the damage it might do. It might induce panic or despair and so weaken efforts to respond creatively to the crises confronting us and the planet. Or 
it might result in a withdrawal of resources from the intellectual class dealing with sustainability. Bendel is very frank and often harsh in his straightforward observations about the interests and effects of the sustainability establishment. Of all his most severe criticisms, one stands out. Sustainability thinking belongs to the same civilizational complexes that created the catastrophe here or Lumi. What does this mean? In its determination to censor public statements about the thinking needed for considering catastrophe, sustainability practice sustains the intellectual, cognitive, and social maladaptation that led to the crisis itself. How so? In terms, terms of the Taleb echo metaphor of the library, thinking about sustainability stays within the library of knowledge. Evidence gives exceptionally good reason to live, think, and practice as if the library itself will collapse. Bendel makes this point in a personal way in one of his papers. Writing about deep adaptation theory, he says, is a personal and career risk. If the world survives, despite the predictions of deep adaptation theory, and remains unchanged, then the theory is wrong and was justly censored by sustainability editors and journals. If the theory is correct, then catastrophe will wipe the theory off the face of the earth, along with its practitioners, extinguishing it along with all ele other elements of human civilization. The collapse of the library of knowledge comes in personal as well as institutional, societal, and evolutionary form. The proper response, as deep adaptation theory would have it, is the echo metaphor of becoming an anti-scholar who lives and thinks in the anti-library. Now, Taleb renames Echo's anti-scholar with the phrase skeptical empiricist. We should become skeptical empiricists. Taleb, however, does not get Echo right with that phrase, which is really derived from David Hume. Taleb takes a very weak position, which is commonly voiced in public about all knowledge and by all knowledge workers, except of course by administrators and political agents who rely on power to assert truth. Taleb's position derives from the work, as I say, of David Hume, who makes certainty difficult, whose thinking tinges with doubt all claims to plain certainty. Echo, however, would have the thinker practice not in doubt, but in the active development of the not known, the vastness and seeming infinitude of which is represented by the Borgesian image of an ever expanding world of bookshelves filled with an ever increasing number of not yet read books. Taleb and Echo agree with Bendel that we take what we know too seriously. Taleb, like Bendel at times, and like David Hume, would have it that we take what we know with too much certainty, or at least with the scientific prejudice that method and procedure advance from what is known through paradigm shifts to a new known, never, of course, quite achieving the desired theory of everything. Echo's metaphor is more useful than Taleb's to thinking within deep adaptation theory, and so much more useful to the species and more friendly to the planet. But Taleb, Echo, and Bendel taken together emphasize humility in place of what Bendel in particular calls the arrogance of technophilic management of hard or soft kinds. While planning can present itself as a response to danger, indeed as appearing from panic in the phrase, we need to do something, planning lacks humility because it does not recognize the belatedness of its own position, its own false and insufferable desire for totalization. In aesthetics, from which we have, I think, something to learn here, in aesthetics, to be belated is to practice what Theodore Adorno and Edward W. Said both called late style, that is, it is to respond creatively to the ruptures and failures of social consensus, 
as Adorno showed to be true in the case of Ludwig Beethoven's style in the famous late sonatas especially, or as willfully resistant, wise, and aware, but not defeated by finitude as it brings finality to the work of a culture, a mind, or a creative tradition, a line of thought associated with Said. In these cases, late style describes a latecomer's belated position as the possibility of creativity in a crisis state, precisely when what was functional, when the concepts that served thought and social organization, when the imagined forms of life long in place cracked under pressure, and on the one hand settled broken into denial and assertion, while on the other hand, perhaps among a minority, it demanded new forms, new imaginings, and new concepts. The extinction catastrophe may, however, make even this culturally recognizable, if severe, difficult, and creative path impossible or valueless. Why make this point? Because deep adaptation theory requires that we confront the loss of even our most beloved, trusted, difficult, and inventive forms of life, thought, and, rela and relation as a step toward reimagining. Late style is the form taken by imagination when what was known, mastered, and efficacious fails. Late style, in that sense, is a practice belonging, again, in Echo's terms, to the anti-scholar, or we might say the anti-artist, conducted within and to expand the anti-library of the not known as the emblem of living and thinking before and in catastrophe. In that sentence, before catastrophe does not mean in time a moment or an eon prior to the cast catastrophe's apocalyptic coming. Before here is to stand before, to confront, to face, to learn what is on offer, to respond to a demand or a gift. Echo's anti-library of expanding unreads and unknowns is the permanent state that must form a new ethic and new politics in which life adjusts, if it may, if it may, to such utter disruption that no effort at national, political, technical, or aesthetic control can or will serve. If you will, it is a permanent state of jeopardy. And as an ethical formulation oddly brings us back to some of the oldest insights within at least the history of Western philosophy, insights which occur at the point where courage and hope confront each other undecidedly as ethos. More than 2,300 years ago in Greece, following the defeat of democratic Athens by authoritarian Sparta, the philosopher Aristotle meditated on courage and hope as part of his broader interest in virtue and good life. I mention Athens then recent defeat by Sparta in the Peloponnesian War to remind us that Aristotle's thinking occurs in the shadow of catastrophe and as such belongs to a generational cultural effort in theater history, morals, epistemology, as well as law and politics, to find new ways of life once the fact of the case made it impossible to hold on to or sanely imagine a return to the modes of life before the catastrophe, to those very modes of life from which the catastrophe emerged. In our time, Aristotle's thinking, we could say, anticipates our own recognition that as we say in the United States, after COVID, and we are not sure what that phrase means anywhere, that after COVID, we know that the status quo ante, what existed before COVID, is not only hard to recover, but undesirable, since it was the source of the disaster that has brought the species to confront one extermination threat while another is already likely underway. All that I say about hope rests on the research I published in Love's Shadow, 
my main point and is forthcoming in another small essay or two. My main point in that book was simple. Research does not support the value of a pragmatic commitment to hope or its strong political and narrative expression as or in stories of utopia or theories of utopia. At the end of the last century, beginning let's say in 1980, up to the economic crises of 2008-9, which sped up the ever expanding combination of authoritarian state politics and neoliberal hyper administration of work and civil society. Political thinkers often, but not always or only self-defined Marxists drew upon the work done by the German philosopher Ernst Bloch more than a hundred years ago in his 1918 book in German entitled Geist der Utopie, The Spirit of Utopia. In a technical sense, Bloch's notion of utopia is a critique of ideological thinking as a negative and intellectual and political gesture that neglects the value to be found in the objects of its own critique, a gesture which thereby negates without consideration for value, the traces of what should be recognized as useful to the human project of freedom in ideological, ideologized productions. The most advanced theorized form of this is to be found in the work of Bloch's rough contemporary, Walter Benjamin. Bloch develops this line of thinking in his three volume masterwork, Das Prinzip Hoffnung, Principle of Hope, Spirit of Hope, published in three volumes from 1938 to 1947 during uh, the Second World War. Bloch's influence extended not only into the revisionist Marxism of the late 20th century, as we see it, for example, in the utopian claims of Frederick Jameson, who insists quite loudly that uh, he and his followers must take up an anti-utopian anti position, but also into the antagonists of such work, indeed of all critique and critical formations. In various forms of affect and aesthetic theorizing, Bloch helps justify the suspension of the negative and a turn to judgment searching for and aestheticizing the positive. In the North American Academy, with some spillover, of course, into Australia and Europe, I think of the uh, American uh, critic Sian Ngai and the Australian-American critic Rita Felsky as followers in this revisionist Blochian tradition while Walter Benjamin's Marxism led him to call commodities vampires in his writing about the Parisian arcades and the commodities on display in their windows, these newer estheticians and their followers find emancipatory, pleasurable, survivalist value and pleasure in the commodity forms and objects that are of course, the only forms of objects met in culture and society. While Bloch began with the negative, and although Ngai would nominally preserve that moment, the post-Marxist Bloch desired desire, sorry, the post-Marxist Bloch's desire to suspend the negative, and I would argue judgment, turns into lifestyle, something of course critiqued by Bloch's contemporary and friend uh, Marcuse, turns into lifestyle, into affect, the pleasure of the object, of the emotion, of the clever, what Ngai calls the trick or the gimmick. These post Jameson maneuvers, however, preserve the element in Jameson that they attacked and that leaves us in trouble. And I submit that is the element of hope, not only as a matter of cognition, but connation. I provided you with this very brief and unfair summary of recent Blockian notions about cultural and political theory to get at the use of hope as a concept in today's advanced thinking about the current situation. But in addition to the technical theories of hope and utopia, so common in the late 20th century, and so displaced by stories of dystopia and apocalypse in the 21st century, there is a popular or pragmatic sense of hope. The 
are points of contact, of course, between the technical and popular, often mediated by commercial and official institutions such as magazines and grant givers. In the popular pragmatic sense of hope, political agents, often activists in the streets and even in mainstream political parties, campaign on the rhetoric of hope. These agents believe they must sustain hope and people's belief in hope or consumption for that matter, in the reasons to hope and for hope to mobilize and carry on the action aimed toward hard to achieve ends. In the US experience, for example, the ongoing struggle by minorities, especially blacks, to have equal and independent existence alongside and within mainstream or dominant cultures requires hope, it is voiced as a problem of hope, at least since the early 19th century before the end of slavery, when confronted by massed forms of resistance organized by the state or culture, which uh, frustrate and trivialize all aspirations. In the, indeed, the state can imprison, reorganize, and surveil a different or resistant people, making their lives, I use this word in quotations, hopeless, that is without hope, unless they adapt to the demands made upon them by power. These can be many, these demands. The response is many, from collaboration to resistance to extermination. Barack Obama, former president of the United States, organized his campaign for power for a realignment of elites as racially diverse around the figure of hope. His campaign book was called The Audacity of Hope. Bill Clinton, you may remember, used to call himself a former president as well. He used to call himself the man from hope. The theme of hope in American politics is absolutely dominant. Obama's campaign book was called The Audacity of Hope, and he entitled its sequel, A Promised Land. The Christian messianic title of the second book is specific to its American place. That is, the U.S. is always figured as the promised land, the city on the hill, God's promised paradise. But Obama's titles stand as well for a movement within the popular imagination from hope to arrival, from acting in the present toward a future we hope to have, that we believe we can and will achieve. In this way, Obama's work, you can see this from its commercial success, as well as its political success. His work is unoriginal and so more easily effective because unoriginal. The technical and popular values of hope subtend and subsist within sustainability practice and discourse. Hope, the term, the concept, the figure of speech, hope also occupies an essential but different place within deep adaptation theory. Once more, what I'm saying here, of course, is that deep adaptation theory itself is not severe enough in its own rejection of the category of hope, nor deep enough in its investigation of the term's function. Once more, deep adaptation theory has weak and strong forms. In its weak form, the theory hopes, colloquially, that advanced sustainability efforts can stimulate needed social reorganization and intellectual invention to confront catastrophe, perhaps to prevent it. In this sense, hope is enduringly preparatory, but not for fulfillment. It is preparatory for abandonment rather than fulfillment. In its strong form, however, deep adaptation theory redefines hope as a corollary of echoes anti-library. Since time is running short, let us represent the issue simply and draw to a conclusion. Using an old metaphor in philosophy and literature, we can see the issue. We will adapt the figure of the memory palace, which dates in Western thinking to the time long before the Christian era. Intellectuals may explicitly create memory palaces not incidentally, by the way, since we're speaking in some way through Hong Kong, it's worth, worth pointing out that the concept of the memory palace was very intensely developed by the Jesuits as they occupied themselves in their attempt to enter China long ago. Intellectuals may explicitly create memory palaces for themselves as a matter of discipline. That is, they may imagine infinitely expandable architectural spaces 
houses, museums, castles, fantastical volumes of space, and populate them with objects. To each object corresponds something of importance, something memorable. Something known or experienced that must have a permanent place in retrievable memory. And so here we become cybernetic. This trick, this gimmick, creates both an image of knowledge, the fact of knowledge, a model of sustainability, if you will, and it creates an ever expanding universe of what can be known, that is owned, accessed, and sustained. The memory palace is an attractive image for intellectuals invested in knowledge and in their role as agents, preserving, transmitting, and reforming or transporting culture and language. It is a depository of the pure historicality of things and the species and is relatively independent, I say relatively, of ethnic, ideological, and linguistic determinants. It can also be a metaphor for the evolutionarily successful sets of concepts. And here's again a glance to the French philosopher Georges Canguillem. It can also be a metaphor for the evolutionarily successful sets of concepts, belief, and old truths. Canguillem, by the way, of course, who was the teacher of Foucault. A set of concepts, beliefs, and old truths forming a society and its mainstream subunits. Deep adaptation theory takes aim at both versions of the memory palace, limiting its value even in its most progressive form. At their best, uh, expert institutionalized knowledge workers construct expandable, organized, but not diverse memory palaces. While as humans in the world, their personal knowledge and sentiment can expand far more, professional standards constrain and constrict. And as we've seen, the ambition for more knowledge does not express the needed ethos. In effect, deep adaptation theory deploys the expansive memory palace's abilities to correlate, conjoin, make adjacent, while projecting and retracting the known to create constellations best able to provide hopeful solutions that must, to be such, be continuous with the status quo, with the old truths that found the memory palace and rely on its functions. However, finally, the memory palace is, as we see, therefore, an obstacle to what is needed. The memory palace assures recognition, which is not what is needed. It assures enough sameness with difference to comfort and to enable new and needed work, whether as invention or preservation. And ideally, it both acts and it, it ideally it does both in acts of transport. In Love's Shadow, in fact, I showed that love forms and motivates this transport. The memory palace is not an intuitive figure to think with, although conceptualized it rewards life by allowing an adaptation to history. It has not a long history, but as a developing practice, as the scholar Frances Yates shows in her great book of 1966, The Art of Memory, it is one basis for scientific method. So deep adaptation theory might be retitled de-adaptation theory. The memory palace is both a form of and monument to adaptation and evidence of hope, of reason to hope for successful transformative adaptation by restoration or technophilic utopia. This beyond the quotidian productive work it facilitates anonymously. In a word, the memory palace must go or it must morph into a version of Echo's anti-library, which is best visualized by the cosmological sense of an ever receding horizon in the universe. As Roger Penrose, for example, has pointed out the speed of light limits observation of a universe expanding faster than the speed of light. Always there will be a beyond the horizon, no matter the effort to expand the library or to make room in it. Unless it also expands as a form of being beyond the horizon, the library and memory palace are antiquated forms of hope, uncritical versions of smooth time and incapable of thinking rupture, the ultimate demand made by catastrophe in our courage. At this point, by the way, Gilles Deleuze would pipe up and say, that's how I describe fascism. The ethos needed to stand before extermination and catastrophe. Must it contain a form of courage? Jonathan Lear in a book entitled Radical Hope published by the University of Chicago in 2008 and admired by developers of deep adaptation theory creates a case study of ethics, a way of living to achieve the good and happy life in the face of total catastrophe. Lear's case study is modeled on a white American extermination of indigenous peoples in North America. 
a practice common in settler states such as the US, South Africa, Canada, and Australia, but also frequent in the building of strong ethno-nationalist states in Asia, Europe, and elsewhere. In all cases, weaker groups of people find their cultures, their ways of life exterminated by the actions of great centralizing powers. Lear studies the case of a man called in English, many coup, although his name translated from the crow would properly re be rendered in English as many achievements. Many coup who led his people, the crow nation, at a time when the American settler state, settler state was exter extirpating the indigenous cultures of peoples contesting US expansion across the continent. Many coup left autobiographies transcribed by sympathetic writers with psychological training. Setting aside problems that might arise from this transcription, note that deep adaptation theory borrows from Lear and his commentary, a renewed radicalized notion of hope dependent on the history of many coup and the destruction of the Crow nation. Many coup led his people to surrender to US military forces and he ad advocated Crow adaptation to the demands of the conquerors because the Crow way of life was gone, destroyed by the invasive force of the American march across the continent. Many coup saw the surrender as the end of history. After the surrender, he told his interlocutors, nothing happened. Despite the charge that he collaborated from cowardice and so betrayed his people, Many coup continued to urge adaptation, endurance, and experiment in new situations. He saved lives, but so the charges against him go, betrayed his own formation as a warrior leader and allowed his people to die as a people in a world that was remade by their conquerors. Now, Lear interprets many coups actions as a unique form of courage, of bravery, and so a transformed version of the warrior culture that enabled him to that point. In other words, many coups courage stood in the face of the unending unknowns, the solutions to which lie, if at all, over the event horizon of the total rupture, the catastrophe of extinction forced upon his people. American pragmatism and Freudian psychoanalysis have influenced Lear's philosophical mode and style. He's a remarkably lucid writer whose contribution to deep adaptation theory balances the apocalyptic thinking voiced by Jamie Lynch. Since deep adaptation theory is at its base, a theory of pragmatic ethos, radical hope offers to the theory an ethical model as pragmatic, etho, pragmatic ethics rather, radical hope offers to the theory an ethical model that especially urban elites from New York to Shanghai, it must be said, must learn if and as they move into the necessary state represented by Echo as the anti-scholar. What does Lear have to offer deep adaptation theory? He helps by defining what makes hope radical, that is alive at its root, and so once more valuable and sustaining as a part of living the good life, no matter the context. Commenting on many coup, Lear writes, and I quote, <clears throat> what makes hope radical is that it is directed to a future goodness that transcends the current ability, it transcends the current ability to understand what it is. End of quote. Urban elites in the view of deep adaptation theorists are like the Crow leaders before the onslaught of the US Army. They cannot see a reason to imagine the end of their civilization and the framing modes for their lives, beliefs, and loves. Catastrophe, of course, can enlighten, but by then it's too late. Ethics demand elites move from their beliefs, from their knowledge, willingly face the extirpation of their societies, think as if that extirpation was inevitable, the extirpation of their societies and culture and their own biological extermination at a personal level to begin the process of adapting to whatever, if anything, if anything is over the horizon. In Radical Hope, Lear reworked Aristotle to justify many coups surrender and seeming collaboration as a form of courage and the fact of which showed the necessity and possibility of hope carefully distinguished from optimism. The Greek philosopher Aristotle once believed that hope undercut courage by weakening the will. Institutional censoring of catastrophic climate science would then be in line with a certain Aristotelian attitude. If people have no reason to believe in their own action, if they have no hope, then they despair and defeat follows inevitably to the point of extinction. 
Hope provides comfort and assurance with a set of futurity, of possibility, of openness that means the seemingly inevitable is not so. The great historian Thucydides wrote about this in his history of the, Th of the Peloponnesian War before the Greek philosophers took it up seriously as a cognitive as well as cognitive problem. Thucydides told the story of the inevitable extermination and defeat of those who hope by those who have power. Aristotle, like many coups, belonged to a defeated warrior society, an inescapable eventuality as all warrior societies are always eventually defeated. Hope weakens courage when experience or desire leads persons, lead persons or societies to believe they can see, and here we return to Bloch, believe they, they can see the desired possible in the visible. Hopelessness is defeat and the end of the will. Confidence, however, based on experience or inference is intellectually weak since it is at best inductive. Therefore, while not every hopeful person will be courageous, courage depends upon the existence of hope. Aristotle, like Lear and deep adaptation theorists, care about, about what Aristotle and others would call the good life. To do so ethically, the human subject, that is to live the good life, ethically, the human subject cannot despair. Despairing people are not courageous. They may appear so in their recklessness or suicide, but they are not. Lear holds that many coups showed courage in drawing himself and his people into a world in which nothing can happen. That is, into a world of the completely unknowable that must be lived, if it can be, to achieve by invention and transport a new form of the good life. This means that Lear has found in many coups the radical hope deep adaptation theory would offer as the necessary ethos for those called to prepare for whatever is, if anything at all, in the unknowable unknown. Deep adaptation theory would instantiate hope as a form of necessary courage shaped by acknowledgement of the unknowable's inescapable arrival. It remains a form of preparation and is itself a form of ascesis, which is a short step from abjection. There's a great deal more to say of all this, but no time. In form, deep adaptation might look like what some forms of utopian science fiction offer culture as a promise that extermination even of the species will not end history. Frederick Jameson's study of science fiction develops this line most completely and assuringly. Even if Jameson can more easily see the end of the world than the end of capitalism, as he has said, he cannot easily see extinction. In his utopian commitment, science fiction, literature of and for the masses, finally guarantees an over the horizon to and into which the existing human can cast itself, especially as desire. This is a familiar motif common in European philosophies of the middle and late 20th century. It appears, for example, in Jameson's enemy, his Beth Noir, Jacques Derrida, where for Derrida, it is a secularization of Jewish, Jewish messianism. What is still strange in all this ethical ambition is its constant need mixed with a desire to find models, even for a situation so foundationally other that it seems impossible at first sight and incomprehensible in all other levels. Deep adaptation theory for all its radicalness, like Lear and his radical hope, preserves an ethical base for a circumstance if it exists at all, so other that whatever might be found in a memory palace or on the shelves of red books in the library we cannot, and more important, should not try to assume. In M.P. Shields' The Purple Cloud, 1901, written in England, hardly a well-written novel, the last man, significantly called Adam Jefferson, alluding, of course, to the biblical Adam, as well as the American Thomas Jefferson, profoundly disoriented and deeply angry at the greatest traces of the lost advanced civilization burns and buries cities, beginning with their museums and libraries. He aims to die, to complete the extermination of the species, but he is unable to resist his own natural biological desire, and so he impregnates the last woman, and he outlasts the final apocalyptic threat, and he accepts to repopulate the world with an Eve whose language is unique and variant. The novel ends in messianic hope with history begun again, this time on the belated assurance of the Hebrew Christian God's word. How different is sustainability's embrace of hope 
or deep adaptations, a brace of courage from Scheele's technique of assuring the future based on the past. Of course, in the here and now, we have nothing else except, one must add, the possible imaginative capacity to create alternatives to what, it, to what already is. Love of the species and the planet requires work now rather than connation or affect. It requires will directing desire to enable possible but unknowns now. Sustainability, radical hope, deep adaptation theory, none of these recognizes the, recognizes the suppression of creative invention done otherwise. Nor do they recognize those time places where such otherwise invention has already been done. This returns us to the original ethical objection to restriction within the already known as established mainstream practices and forms. Something other and seemingly unknowable exists in shadows not yet seen. There, rather than in hope, lies an ethos for alternatives to what is, even as what is leads to, leads to its own likely extermination. And in ironic viciousness, it leads to the extermination of the other from which it would not learn how to be otherwise. Thank you very much.